Down in southwest Ecuador, there's a fossil site called Tenke Loma, and it's home to one of prehistory's weirdest mass graves. Layer after layer of the site is jam-packed with thousands of bones from one of the biggest herbivores to ever roam the Americas, the giant ground sloth. But here's the kicker. What makes this place so bizarre isn't just the sheer number of dead sloths, and it's not even that they all died around the same time. No, it's how they died. A cause of death so undignified and strange, it sounds like something out of a very dark comedy. Now, I've seen my fair share of fossil death scenes, the kind where nature pulls no punches. Predators mid-attack, creatures frozen in volcanic ash, or animals caught in freak disasters. But sometimes the real head scratchers aren't the violent ends. They're the weird random ones, the kind where you're left thinking, how in the world did that even happen? And for this first case, we're going big both in size and in sheer oddity. Tenquiloma isn't just any fossil site. It's a final resting place for a specific type of ground sloth called Rimotherium. These guys were absolute units, around 4.5 tons, stretching up to 20 feet long and towering roughly three times taller than a human when standing. Honestly, if you saw one, you'd think elephant with claws before you'd think sloth. Their skeletons were insanely sturdy and dense, built to withstand almost anything nature threw at them. Yet in this spot, paleontologists uncovered nearly two dozen of these behemoths, all dead, all from roughly the same time period, between 18,000 and 23,000 years ago. At first, the cause seemed obvious. The site had traces of asphalt, kind of like the famous La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, where animals got trapped in sticky pools and fossilized. But there was a problem. Here, the asphalt only covered part of the bodies, not all of them. In La Brea, animals usually sank deep, becoming fully coated. So, scratch that theory. And as strange as death by tar might sound, the real answer turned out to be far messier. When scientists dug deeper, they found an entire layer surrounding the sloths made up of chewed and digested plant matter. In other words, a giant ancient layer of sloth poop. And not just a little. We're talking enough waste to cover a group weighing over 80 tons combined. Picture something out of Jurassic Park, but with Ian Malcolm pointing at a mountain of number two, Rather than confusion, this was actually the smoking gun researchers needed. They pieced together a grim picture. The sloths had been feeding in the area and the shallow pool they used as a watering hole slowly became a cesspool as their droppings built up. Over time, it turned into a breeding ground for harmful bacteria, parasites, and toxins. The sloths kept drinking from and wallowing in the contaminated water until disease and poisoning finally took them out. If that sounds far-fetched, there's actually a modern parallel. In the 1970s, during a drought in Tanzania, a herd of about 140 hippos crowded into a shallow pool for water. Within weeks, the buildup of their waste poisoned the water, killing over 100 of them. The soil chemistry at Tenke Loma suggests the same thing happened here. Drought, cramped conditions, contaminated water, and a truly miserable ending. Now, not all strange prehistoric deaths are this gross. Some are just awkward. Take the fossil frogs from Geiseltal, Germany, a 45 million year old mass grave containing hundreds of perfectly preserved frogs. At first glance, they were all in great shape. No sign of disease, no predator marks, no scavenging for decades. No one had a clue why they all died. The breakthrough came when scientists compared them to modern frogs and toads. It turns out, some frog species suffer massive die-offs during mating season, especially when males overwhelm females in shallow water, causing them to drown. The Geiseltal frogs likely lived on land most of the year and weren't strong swimmers. So when breeding season rolled around, the combination of frantic mating and poor swimming skills was lethal. Nature's awkward dating scene, fossilized for eternity. And while those ancient amphibians are long gone, frogs today face their own mass die-offs. Only this time, it's mostly due to human impact and climate change. The difference is modern frogs can still be saved if conservation efforts keep going strong. 
Planet Wild's not just some vague save the planet group, they're 100% upfront about where every cent goes. And the projects? They're global. One month, it might be protecting coral reefs. The next, it's rainforest patrols. And in this case, they partnered with researchers in Ecuador to pull off something huge, finding, breeding, and releasing endangered frog species on the brink of vanishing forever. That's a big deal because frogs worldwide are getting hammered by a fast-spreading fungal disease called chytrid. In Ecuador alone, more than 170 species have already vanished completely. Here's the kicker. This mission worked. The team even found a male from a species thought to have been extinct for decades. It hadn't been seen since the 1980s and only resurfaced in February 2012. Normally, news like that is the kind of quiet victory you'd stumble across buried in a scientific journal months after the fact. Even though those geyseltal frogs were having, let's say, a spirited time, drowning still isn't exactly a great way to go. But at least it's quick compared to what happened to one very unlucky pterosaur, a ludodactylus from the early Cretaceous of Brazil. This wasn't a small flyer either. It had that classic pterosaur look you'd expect from a toy store pteranodon. Long wings, crest on the head, teeth for days. But the real story is in its fossil. At first glance, you can tell something's seriously off. Lodged in its jaw is a sharp, stiff object that turns out to be a yucca leaf. Now, yucca plants still grow today, and if you've ever brushed up against one, you know why they're nicknamed Adam's Needle and Spanish bayonet. Those leaves are basically botanical spears. The paleontologists think this pterosaur wasn't trying to eat it. It wasn't a plant eater, but instead collided with a yucca while flying at high speed. The leaf pierced straight into its lower jaw, locking in place like a barbed arrow. From there, things went downhill fast. With its mouth mangled, the ludodactylus couldn't feed or drink properly the wound would have festered, infection setting in, the animal growing weaker by the day until it finally died. To this day, it's the only known fossil of an animal killed by a leaf. Rare? Sure, but plants, especially the spiky ones, aren't always as innocent as they look. Case in point, another Cretaceous victim, this time a turtle, impaled not by a yucca, but by a tree branch. That fossil comes from the Tanis site in North Dakota, one of the most remarkable fossil deposits on Earth. Tanis is special because it captures the exact aftermath of the asteroid impact that ended the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. The scene's like a prehistoric crime scene frozen in time. Among the finds, that skewered turtle, fish with their gills packed full of molten glass-like debris called microtectites, ant nests full of the same stuff, a Thessalosaurus mummified by the ejecta blast and piles of dinosaurs crushed by massive inland waves. Many of these fossils are preserved in full 3D, not squashed flat, because the waves jumbled and buried them so quickly they stayed intact, like sardines in a can. And here's the crazy part. Tanis is almost 1,900 miles from the impact crater in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. That's about the distance from Cairo to Paris. Yet even at that range, the area was rocked by massive earthquakes, hit by waves over 300 feet tall, pelted with searing debris, and slammed by a blast wave that would have been felt around the world. But asteroid strikes aren't the only way nature can pull off a bad day. Volcanoes can be just as merciless. For that, we head to Cappadocia in Turkey, a region famous for its alien-looking rock spires, all created by massive ancient eruptions. In 2012, scientists there found the skull of a prehistoric rhino, a member of the same genus as modern white rhinos. This guy was smaller than today's rhinos, but still a two-ton heavyweight. Despite its size, the rhino's end came fast and brutal. The fossil's teeth were brittle, the bone surface roughened, classic signs of exposure to extreme heat. The culprit? A Vesuvius-style eruption. The rhino was likely caught in a flow of lava or superheated ash over 750 degrees Fahrenheit, 400 degrees Celsius. 
Within moments, it was burned, dehydrated, and then hit by a pyroclastic surge, a hurricane of gas, ash, and rock moving at freeway speeds that literally blew its body apart. Only the skull survived intact. And believe it or not, this wasn't a one-off. Prehistoric rhinos seem to have had a knack for death by volcano. In Washington state, an unusual cave found a century ago preserved a similar volcanic fatality, but that one came with a strange twist. Sometimes a fossil site gives us more than bones. Sometimes it gives us an entire landscape shaped by one unlucky creature's final moments. That's exactly what happened in Washington state where an unusual cave was discovered about a century ago. At first, it just looked like a strange rock cavity, but the shape was odd, shallow, with two prongs at the top and a bulge on one side. After studying it, researchers realized it wasn't a coincidence. This cave was actually a mold, the hardened outline of a prehistoric rhino. In this case, it was probably Dicerotherium, a rhino genus that roamed North America during the late Oligocene and early Miocene. Fossilized bones found nearby backed the theory, and here's the kicker. The cave was shaped like the rhino upside down. That detail was huge because large animals that die in water often bloat and flip belly up, and that gave paleontologists the story. Millions of years ago, this rhino was wallowing in a waterhole when a volcanic eruption sent a slow-moving sheet of lava its way. It likely didn't even touch the animal right away. The heat ash and toxic gases would have done the job first, an agonizing end. After death, the bloated rhino floated upside down until the lava finally reached the water surrounding the carcass. The water cooled the lava instantly, sealing the animal inside like a hot tomb. Over time, the body decayed, leaving behind a hollow mold. Millions of years later, wind erosion split the mold open, revealing it to the world, part fossil, Park cave. Rough deal for the rhino, but discoveries like this make you wonder, could there be a dinosaur cave out there waiting to be found? Odds aren't great, but hey, stranger things have happened in paleontology. And speaking of strange, let's talk about one of the rarest mass deaths in the human fossil record. Not modern humans, Australopithecus are distant relatives. This case isn't about the famous Lucy, but a site known as AL333, nicknamed the First Family. Discovered in Ethiopia's Afar Triangle, it contains the remains of at least 17 Australopithecus individuals, all from different ages, all dead in the same place at the same time, over 3.2 million years ago. That's almost unheard of. Finding one early hominin skeleton is rare. Finding a family group that died together that's jackpot level rare. But the big mystery is, what killed them? The first idea was a flash flood, a pretty common mass death cause in the fossil record, but sediment analysis ruled that out. Then came a darker possibility, a massacre. Not by other hominins, but by predators. Large cats became the prime suspects, especially saber-toothed species like Homotherium, Megantarion, or Dinophalus. They could have surplus killed the group, killing more than they could eat, and left behind telltale missing bones from fingers and toes, which big cats sometimes swallow for calcium. The problem? We don't know for sure if those saber tooths hunted in packs, and it's hard to picture a solo cat taking down over a dozen Australopithecus at once, which is why some scientists prefer a second theory, mass food poisoning. If the group ate something toxic, maybe contaminated plants or spoiled roots, it could have wiped them out fast. But for vegetarians living in a varied environment, that's still a stretch. So for now, AL333 remains one of prehistory's coldest cold cases. Of course, bizarre fossil deaths aren't limited to land mammals. In the Jurassic Seas, paleontologists kept finding fossils of the small fish Tharsis with the remains of a squid-like belemnite jammed inside their mouths or throats. At first, it looked like predator versus prey gone wrong, except belemnites wouldn't normally attack fish that big, and Tharsis wasn't exactly chasing giant squid. The clue came when scientists noticed many of the belemnites had bivalves growing on them, meaning they were already dead before these encounters. As the belemnite bodies floated to the surface, gases in their internal shells kept them buoyant, 
To Atharsis, these floating shapes looked like easy snacks. Unfortunately, the hard, pointed rostrum of the Belemnite could slip right through the fish's mouth into its gills. Once lodged, the fish couldn't breathe or spit it out, leading to a slow suffocation. And there you have it, from giant sloths drowning in their own waste, to frogs dying mid-romance, to rhinos turned into caves, to fish fatally fooled by dead squid. Some of the strangest deaths the fossil record has to offer. For every one of these stories we figured out, there are millions more lost to time, never fossilized or still waiting to be found. If nothing else, they're a reminder that life on Earth has always been unpredictable. Nature doesn't care if you're a four-ton ground sloth, a flying reptile with a 13-foot wingspan, or a tiny Jurassic fish. Bad luck and bad timing will find you eventually. So next time you think you're having a rough day, remember, at least you're not a prehistoric fish with a dead squid stuck in your throat. Click the video on your screen to keep learning with us, and I'll see you in the next one.